I'm okay. Kelsey Hightower. Uh, I retired last year in July. A lot of y'all know me from my work in the Kubernetes space. I spent the last eight years at Google. A lot of open source work from the days of configuration management, Puppet. And I got invited to talk career stuff, you know, like a lot of people are probably starting a career. I do talk to a lot of people that are at midpoints in their career where they're trying to figure out what's the next jump. Do you go to management? Do you become a senior engineer? At the end of the day, I think all of us are trying to use our skills to control our own destiny. So hopefully today we'll dive into the details. And if you got questions, please make sure you add them to the stream so we can have a lively discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Couldn't have said it any better. So um, I usually like to start from the very beginning. Um, what inspired you to uh, pursue a career in tech? I mean, look, I, I've answered this question before, and, and I think for most people, you're just doing what's necessary. You know what I mean? Like getting into tech is just a happy stance. There's no grand plan where it's like, I'm watching people on TV and tech and said, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be in tech like those people. You know, I grew up in the 80s, right, in Long Beach, California. So what I saw on TV were uh, people playing sports. It's like, man, maybe I can play sports. So when I went outside to play, that's what we did. We played sports as our pastime, basketball, football. That's what we were interested in. It wasn't until I got to, like, high school where even this concept of a career in technology, right, because during that time, all we saw was people like Bill Gates selling Windows, Microsoft becoming this juggernaut. I mean, there's the internet, but most of us didn't really have access to it because what were you going to do on there? Ain't nobody sending a teenager email at that particular time. So none of that stuff was necessarily inspiration, but it was more about there's an alternative path, right? I'm only 5'9". I'm not playing professional sports, so that's out. The only jobs I had during that time period, you know, we're talking now from like 95 through high school, 99, are like fast food jobs, right? McDonald's you get the job that's by your house, right? Whatever's in walking distance, that's where you apply because that's the only place you can get to reliably. So the inspiration of doing this technology thing came from a class in high school, uh, the Technology Student Association, TSA. And it was an after school program. If you did it, you got extra credits. There was also an elective, you know, in, in American high schools, you can do things like wood shop where you learn woodworking. You can do home ec, you know, learn how to cook, maybe sew some clothes. But also there's this technology component where you just got introduced to the world of technology. So this is gonna be things like AutoCAD and construction, you know, building a bridge that can be stress tested. You did things like chapter team debate. So coming together and having a group of people solve a problem and explain their, their particular solution. And so for me, just seeing that, oh, technology is pretty broad from photography to writing code that runs in your TI-86 calculator. And so that just kind of sparked this interest in like, man, I like solving puzzles. Before I used to use that skill to play video games. You know, you play these Nintendo games where, you know, you got to solve some puzzles to get to the finish line. And it turns out that that same skill set, that same kind of passion for playing games translated well, at least for me, into the world of technology. So that was probably the first kind of nudge in that direction. And I think it was not deciding not to go to college was the kind of the final state. If I'm not going to college, then that means I'm not gonna be a doctor and I'm definitely not gonna be a lawyer. Those require college educations. And only jobs I've known since that point were fast food. So then what gives, what are you going to do? What are you gonna get into? And so for me, knowing that, you know, at that time, A plus certification was being popular. You would look at job posting. If you have some Linux experience, if you got this certification, then you can apply for these jobs. And that's when I said, you know what? This feels like I can control my own destiny on my own terms. If I can put in the effort, study on my own, go take these certifications, I felt that that was a sustainable path. So that's the one I chose. That's very interesting. And this, the reason why I ask that usually as the first question is, I think you've touched on it. It's the fact that there's very limited pathways. Um, so my follow-up then is, how did you even figure out, I think you touched on the class, but you know, that wasn't an era where you had, you know, this abundance of, of technology influencers who were showing the path. How did you kind of like deconstruct that process from looking at the job postings to say, this is what I needed to do to get to where I needed to be? It's 2024, there is infinite pathways. God, mm -hmm. man, what? 
If you sit at your house and you say, I want to get into tech, there's a trillion pathways. Free online courses, your phone, your iPad, all these devices got full programming environments on them for free. Mm-hmm. If you're on Mac, Xcode is for free. If you're on Windows, you can go get VS Code for free. Everything is accessible. You want to watch how to do anything, go to YouTube, and there's a thousand people eager to teach you everything you want to know. There was zero of that in 99. So honestly, for me, it was just knowing, you know, you go to a bookstore and you're walking down the technology aisle, you're seeing C++, you know, learn this, learn that in 24 hours. And you're like, I don't know what any of this is, but then it's like A plus certification. So you pick that one, right? Because you've seen A plus certification on the jobs that people were hiring for. Hey, this job, we want a little bit of experience, A plus certification prefer, right? So you read that and you go to the bookstore and you're like, what's A plus certification? And you grab this book, it's $35. You're asking yourself, $35? Like you can spend that on a, a decent dinner and all you got was a meal for one night. Or you can buy this book for $35. My mom used to tell me this phrase back in the day, uh, if you want to hide something from a certain group of people, you put it in a book. Because mm-hmm. they're not going to take the effort to read it. And it's just right there in plain sight. $35, you grab the book and you're flipping through it. Hey. This is the exam. These are the objectives that are covered. In this book, and this book is like three to 400 pages, we cover all of the objectives. And on the back, there's a CD where you can take practice exams. And for someone like me, you're reading the chapters, you put the CD in and you're doing the multiple choice and you're getting them right. And then you get to a point where you're not just guessing. You know what the right answer is. So at that moment, I, I have this feedback loop that's saying, you're making progress. You, you actually understand what the CPU and the memory do on a motherboard. And so to me, that's when I was like, I'm going to go get this A plus certification. So at that moment, it's like you buy the book, you do well in the practice exams, and then you paid $100 and you go take the test. And if you pass the test, you now have the certificate. Does the certificate mean that much? Probably not. Not in the grand scheme of things. But for someone trying to find their way, it's a big morale and confidence boosted that you've made progress. So then the next thing you do, you start applying for jobs, right? You start taking a little bit more risk and saying, hey, I feel like I've made another milestone. Let's go test that on the open market. Hmm. And, and that's a nice segue to the next one. So the biggest hurdle, and I think many people don't think about it, because typically when you try to break into tech, your focus, and rightly so, is just learning the skills, right? But the process of you know, applying to jobs, getting rejected, refining that resume, going on an interview, getting rejected at that interview, learning the act of passing an interview to getting that job in itself can be very daunting. How how did that play out for you? This is real life. What do nobody owe you nothing? Hmm. When you're a child and you want to learn how to ride a bike, we can say the same things, right? You don't know how to ride a bike. You've never ridden a bike before. It can be daunting. When people see you fall, the neighborhood kids like, like, look at him, look at him, you just fail. And it's funny, right? It's like, what you doing? And so you could decide to give up. Or you can do what it takes to learn how to ride the bike. You might be fortunate where you have a good teacher around. Maybe you're fortunate enough to have a parent that's going to show you how to ride the bike. Or maybe it's your friend that lives down the street that had already learned how to ride a bike. He's going to show you how to ride his bike because you don't have one. That's just life. When you try to talk to girls for the first time, when you go to the mall, you'd be fresh. Right? You're saying you look in the mirror, you're like, I got all my Christmas clothes on. Right? She don't owe you any response. She don't owe you her phone number. Right? You have to go and present yourself. Right? You got to figure out that conversation. And if you've never done that before, it's very awkward. And when that girl was like, nah, I got a boyfriend. Okay. You need to move on. <laughs> you know what I mean? So rejection is a natural part of life. Failing at something that you don't know how to do is a natural part of life. So for me, growing up in Long Beach, California, where I played outside all the time, you play sports with kids that are older than you, you go for your little layup, they block your shot all the way to the other side of the school buildings. This is just normal, but you got to pay attention to your participation in society from, you know, as a child going up to become an adult. So when you start applying for jobs, what's the difference? You presenting yourself in front of this employer, they have all these other people to choose from. Why are they choosing you? And your job is to give them a valid reason to choose you. Look, you may not have the skills. Then they shouldn't choose you. 
some of y'all wouldn't hire yourself. And so if you're at that point, then you got work to do. It's not wrong with that having work to do. So in my opinion, that's just part of it. You don't need to be saying words like imposter syndrome. You don't have no skills. You are not a senior engineer. Nothing wrong with that. Embrace that feeling. And now you got to ask yourself, am I willing to do the work necessary to change the situation? And the last thing I'll say here is a lot of this stuff is circumstantial, right? Maybe we're looking for someone that wants to take less salary. So you have the skills, you're probably the right person, but we can't afford you, right? You want 150 a year, this other person want 98. We look at our budget and that's all we can afford. So we went with the one for 98. You do the same thing, you go to car dealership. The Ferrari look nice, but you got Toyota Camry money. So you get the Toyota Camry and you drive where you gotta go. There's nothing wrong with that, you just needed a car. So I think we gotta put all those factors in mind. And I would just say, don't give up on the rejection. Just use that rejection as a feedback loop. And I'll, I'm here to tell you that tends to go away over time because eventually your confidence level matches your skill level and people can see it when they talk to you just for a few minutes. So just keep working at it. Hmm. That, those are some major gems right there. So after your first role, you went on to start an electronic store business. What inspired to take that entrepreneurial leap after like you know getting your feet wet, wet in tech? I think the thing that I've got to be clear and try to reiterate the most, there is mm -hmm. no strategic plan at this time. I'm 18 mm -hmm. years old. I don't have no strategy. I'm not sitting here, I'm gonna do this and then this is gonna happen. This is not no James Bond movie. You don't know all of these details. You're 18, you get A plus certified. You get Network Plus certified. The place where you took the exam, there's a career fair that day. You walk out with your certificate in hand. And then it turns out somebody's hiring for contractors to drive around the city, installing high-speed internet access for people. They can teach you this in a day. You, you go on the road with this one dude, he knows what he's doing. He got his tool bag, he say, hey, this is how you greet the customer, follow the address, take your shoes off, you go in, you look at the computer. If they got USB ports, you give them this modem. If they ain't got a you know, fasten the computer, open it up, put a network card in there. So then you're doing this, you're making decent money, and then one day you go to a business, like a little small insurance company. You go in, you put in the internet access. And then they're like, yo, we got eight computers in this office. And I know that you're only supposed to hook up one computer, then you can leave. But is there any way that you can hook up all the computers? And you're like, I can try, but I can't do it right now because I got to go to the other call. How about this? I'll come back later and I'll figure it out for you. And he's like, well, how much is it going to be? He's like, I don't know. I got $150 to install this. Make it $300 and I'll hook them all up. You don't even know if that's the right price. You're just guessing. So you go to Office Depot and you buy a little router, right? And the router is like, look, hook in the modem here and hook in these cables to the other machines. And you're like, how you make an Ethernet cable? Because they ain't selling one that's long enough. And you learn how to make your Ethernet cable. So you do everything. Now, the first time you do it, it takes you all night. You're over there overnight. Like they give you the keys and say, hey, it's nine o'clock. We got to go. You say, hey, give me the keys. I'll lock up when I'm finished. I'm almost done. It's 6 a.m. and you still not finished. But by the time they get there by seven, all the computers is working. You've kind of built up this new expertise now. You know what it takes. You failed a bunch of times that night. There ain't no work-life balance. At this point, I need these skills to complete the job. I told this person I can do it. And now I'm about to figure it out. So now I got it working. Turns out D-Link might be a little bit better than the Netgear for this particular install. So now you like, hmm, I can add a little extra sauce to it. So now when I'm starting to get these businesses, I'm like, yo, if you need somebody to hook this up, I got you. And then you start carrying routers in the car. You're like, yo, I'm going to finish this, sign off. I'm going to leave, come back, and I'll take care of the router. So once I'm starting to do that, I'm like, yo, I should just open a small computer shop where maybe I can start, you know, like sometimes you go to people's house, the computer, you know, they done clicked on the wrong website, stuff popping up. You say, hey, I know you got these pictures popping up on your website. I know you probably clicked on the wrong thing. We can fix that. And so now you're starting to think, man, there's more product and services that I could be adding to this. So I opened up a little computer store just to have a little home base. Some of the people I was working with bought them on. And it's like, we're going to make service calls, but we're going to do internet install. We're going to do virus fixing. 
you know, people stuff go, I'm going to do all these things. So then it's like, you just happen to have a small business and you figure out what you need to do to be legal doing that. So again, it's just one of these things where when you pay attention to what's going on, you start to see opportunities and you're like, yo, what's the best way for me to take advantage of this opportunity? And I remember when I got the first big check, there was one job I did. It was like three or $4,000. And they're like, who would you make the check out to? And I gave them my name. They're like, sir, we don't write checks to people. We write checks to companies. And I remember on the spot, I just made up a name, uh, Digital Gateways. And they're like, no problem, Digital Gateways. And I'm sitting here with a check I can't cash. I ain't got the business license. I don't have the name. I don't have no business bank account. So I'm online trying to figure out how to get all of this stuff in place. And then once I do, I open a bank account. And then I'm like, yo, now I can finally, after a few weeks, cash this check written to this, this business. So it's one of these things where you just pay attention and you just do what's necessary to just move forward. That's it. Yeah, that's 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 a, a very fascinating entrepreneurial story. So after doing all this, I think you learn you land your first major role. What was that feeling like for you? And you know, were there things that you also kind of like figured out in that journey that helped you make that transition? Okay, so at this time I did this computer thing and consulting stuff for about two or three years. I was helping company, I was in Atlanta right around the time when the music scene was really jumping off. People were moving away from the big physical mixing boards to the digital stuff, Pro Tools. And so I was helping companies get Pro Tools set up, bring the whole thing. And I just became a part of the community at large of the computer guy, the guy that can do the things. I was managing a comedian at that time. We were making money. He was on the road doing big shows. The company behind it, Latham Entertainment, that's the company that did the kings and queens of comedy. I started doing consulting for them, making a little bit more money. So at this point, you hustling, right? There's, it feels like there's no limit to your income. And eventually, though, you start to realize that you kind of stretch too thin, right? You're on the road doing this stuff. You're managing the business. Someone's watching the story, making service calls. There's a lot that goes into that. And when you think about it, when I started seeing how much you can just make with one job, so a lot of people get confused with this idea of like, I'm a business owner. There are a lot of people that own businesses that don't even turn a hundred thousand dollars in profit per year. You can go get a job and make double that. So when I was looking for jobs, I was like, you know what? I need to make this transition. I'm married now. I got a kid on the way. And I'm like, you know what? I need something that doesn't require so much hustle. So let me just make a little pivot. So I'm spinning out and I'm like, you know what? In Atlanta, there's these data centers starting to pop up. So this is way before cloud. We're talking, now we're at 2004, maybe 2005. And Google has this data center down the way. And I'm like, you know what? You know, even though I was a business owner, kind of dictating my own terms, what would it be like to get one of those jobs that I used to dream about? Because in many ways, I did the store owner stuff and the entrepreneurial stuff, because in some way I was just too afraid to apply for those jobs and get rejected by you know, the enterprise standards, but my confidence now was high. I was well studied, I was ready. And so I went to apply to a job at Google, one of the toughest interviews I ever went through back in the day. And it was like, hey, you know, all this trivia question, so I get this job, now I'm working. And the one thing that I learned the most was, most employees don't have no hustle. It's just, I do only what you told me, and I'm leaving, and there's no entrepreneurial spirit. So I'm working next to these folks, and I'm like, pushing boundaries. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be the best at what I'm doing. Not that I'm competing because it ain't no competition, but it's more like, man, I want to be the best at this. How do I be the best at data center operations? I want to learn every skill, networking, compute, diagnostic, power audits, whatever it is, I'm learning everything. And I'm like, I'm only making like $45,000. So then you look up another job's paying 60. So six months later, you go to the next job. And then 60 turns into 80, 80 turns into 90, 90 turns into 120. And so I'm doing this kind of bouncing around for a while until I get to a financial institution where I was like, all right, it's time to settle in and just kind of work on bigger problems that take years instead of weeks or months. Okay, that's, that's amazing. And in terms of you kind of like settling in that moment, because I, I know like this is another like big wave that you hear about in tech. You know, there's always this um, conversation between um, 
moving a job every six months or two years, however long, to either planting your foot somewhere and growing there. Um, how did you make that decision in that moment to say, you know, I wanted to stay here and build something? So now I'm older now, right? So at this time, I'm probably 25, 26, and I'm a bit more strategic, right? I have the entrepreneurial mindset behind me. I've been at a few companies, I understand how it works. Those entry-level jobs, they're literally hired to do tasks, right? This ticket comes in, we need you to do this task. Manage this server, manage this network. Those are tasks. You don't need to be nowhere for no three years doing tasks. Right? Some people got 20 years of one year experience because all they've been doing is tasks for 20 years. Look, nothing wrong with that. That's what you want to do and it supports your family and your life. That's you. But for me, you get to a point where you start to grow beyond that. So I'm starting to dabble in the world of open source. I'm speaking at local meetups and I'm starting to understand the diff difference between activities, doing tasks and impact, changing how a company moves and operates. So when you get to a situation where you can change how a company moves and operates, something clicks. You're not looking for jobs based on what tasks you can do. Your resume, when you start off, is all about, I can do these type of tasks. I can do Linux tasks, system administration tasks. And I went to this web hosting company and mostly started in tech support, then moved to the engineering team. But I remember being in tech support and I'm watching all of us just sitting here taking calls. You get a call. People like my server's broke, database broke, and you all are individually fixing the calls. It's hyper inefficient. Some people taking calls where they want even experts on the particular topic, so then they're wasting too much time, or they open a ticket and the tickets just sit and they pile up. And one day I just said, hey guys, how about this? We're gonna try something different. We get in the same request pretty much every time. We can just write scripts for the most common cases. So look, if you get a call for something that's common, open a ticket quickly. Move on to the next call. And then I would just sit off the phone and I would just run scripts and fix all the tickets quickly. So the ticket queue just stayed to zero. We hyper efficient. Everybody just chilling because we got everything under control. I was like, you know what? I changed how the team worked. So instead of having everybody on all the calls, we started having two people that was dedicated to tickets and focused on automating things and streamlining how we worked. And a lot of that effort led me to the engineering team where I was like, now I'm writing code. Now I'm starting to detect big problems. And so at that moment, I'm like, okay, I got a whole different set of skills and a different way to apply them. So that next interview, I kind of muscled up the courage to go work or apply for a financial institution. I'm like, yo, the tech stack is bigger. Everything's a bit more mature. There's a lot more at stake. And I, re I didn't know how good I was until I got to that interview. They asked me these questions and I'm just answering them like clockwork. So they ask you a question, you answer the trivia and you said, but if you zoom out, here's the real problem. So yes, that's the right answer, but this is the right situation. Before I can even drop, cause I went to this interview on my lunch break, before I could get back to, to work, they got a job offer say, hey, we want to double what you making. So I'm like, that's where I'm going to work. And when I got there, I started to actually become like a full person. You know, if I saw a process that was broken, I would recommend a fix, but also in a way that included the other people like, yo, you know, we can make this hot together. This is what we currently doing. Let me show you something, a different way to do it. And then you, you just start to emerge as a leader and then you start to make impact. And I just end up staying like three years, making a ton of impact. I'm also contributing to open source. I found like a safe place to make progress. Mm. Um, this question particularly is going to be for me because I also have like a long entrepreneurial history. And one of the things that I've realized, of course, I've, I've made a lot of adaptation myself um, in corporate is that it doesn't always go over well, right? It, because oftentimes you're coming with a different mindset to the mindset that exists there. Um, but again, I think towards the end, you've talked about even how you made that work. What were some of those challenges you faced in that moment trying to do things differently? And how did you figure out a way, for example, to what you described to bring in other people in so it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm smarter than everyone, but it's more like, let's work together to make this change. I mean, eventually I realized none of it mattered. It don't, it don't, we make too big of a deal with this stuff. The team is using Apache in production, taking credit card transactions from Visa. It's not working. Change window start at midnight, ends at 6 a.m. 
If they can't get it tuned or working, then they have to stop and try again and tell all the customers, we're going to figure out why we're dropping too many transactions when the load comes in. Okay, so this is the problem. As an engineer, you like, yo, I got Nginx over here with the perfect config that based on my testing, it's going to reduce memory usage by 70%, network utilization by some other factor, and the problem is going to go away. And they're looking at you like, now, we only use Nginx or Apache because some security people are afraid of any new technology. This is not certified. It's not approved. We can't put this in production. Something, something, something. You're looking at them like, y'all are just literally making up stuff that has nothing to do with actual technical engineering and the science that goes behind finding a better solution. But I understand who I'm, I'm dealing with people. You're afraid. You're afraid. You don't, you've been using Apache so long, you don't know that there's another solution. So now you've got to listen. So you say, hey, here's my recommendation. Like, hey, Kelsey, we're not going to change that because then we've got to contact all our customers and tell them we move them from Apache to Nginx. Like, why are you lying? What customer care about the web server? You're just making stuff up, right? And so you start to listen. You say, okay, I see why these people are scared. Now, here's the thing. I got to make sure I know what I'm talking about. I can't be suggesting stuff that I haven't even touched with my hands, demonstrated working in some lower environment. You can't just be saying stuff because then you lose trust when the time comes. So I'm just waiting. Change window after change window, week after week. And one day I was like, look, I told the CTO, I said, listen, man, I can guarantee I can fix this. It's been weeks. We losing money because we got to pay customers back when we're down. I'm telling you right now, I guarantee I can fix it. And, you know, and the way you get this to this guarantee, you got QA on your side. Hey, QA, could y'all test and make sure everything looking good? Hey, other developer, can you test and make sure everything looking good? Am I missing something? So you, now you kind of got like this team behind you a little bit. So it's like, all right, so when we get into the change window, I'm going to take Apache down. I'm going to put Nginx up. You go run the smoke test. I'm going to make sure everything legit. And I told them I might have to restart this stuff all window. But I promise you when we leave, it's going to be right. Now, here's the deal. Now, if we win, if this works, I need pizza every day of the week for the whole team. And the CTO's name is Paul Daffin. He's like, you want pizza for the whole team? I said, every day, though. We want a pizza from a different place every day to celebrate what happened. So think about what happened. You go into the change window. Everybody a little bit desperate, right? Because sometimes you got to wait until people are desperate enough for the change. Being right at the wrong time don't matter. Mm -hmm. Because if they would have went to that change window and just changed some little config on Apache and it would have worked, no one would have cared about Nginx. Because honestly, it don't matter whether it was Nginx or Apache. Honestly, if I was being straightforward, I probably could have did this work with Apache. I just landed on Nginx. So it took me a little longer to mature to that point. And so when that pizza party come in and everybody eating they slice, they can feel it. This is what change feel like. So that's, that's the way I did it. So all this stuff about, oh, man, they hating on me and, you know, they, they stuck in their ways. It's like, of course they stuck in their ways because you're going to leave in six months. And then if the thing you propose don't work, then their team got to deal with it. So you got to have empathy for the whole equation and just realize that sometimes you just got to wait until the opportunity truly presents itself. And when you get that chance, you got to show and prove. Because if you don't, this is why we don't let you do nothing. Hmm. Hmm. That's some major keys right there. So networking is one of the things that I've um, that I've seen work a lot in tech, meeting people, communicating with people, engaging with people. Um, I think you even touched about how you're building coalitions essentially within your workspace to deliver some of these solutions. How has that played out in your career? I want people to go outside. If you listen to this, go outside. Ask your mailman what their name is. Hey, what's your name? How long you been a mailman? Right? Maybe ask some curious fact about how mail works. Like the more people you learn and know, typically it's better for you in society. Right? Like imagine this, you, you're driving down the road, you get pulled over, you roll down the window and the police say, oh, Kelsey, man, what you doing, man? Slow down. Right? Because you met them at the PTA meeting and you asked them what they did and say, I'm a police officer. You understand? So that networking tends to have this network effect that may pay off down the road. So in your tech career, it's no different. 
I'm a software engineer. You walking around like you're the most important role at the company. You don't know nobody in support. You ain't never walked over to the support team and asked them what's the, the biggest issues that are going on. You never walk to the QA team and say, hey, am I turning in software that's of any quality? If I could do something different as a software developer, what would it be? So when you start to move this way, when you leave work and someone on the support team is complaining about the last release causing more problems than it's worth, us losing customers and losing business because it seemed like the development team is reckless. Instead of that happening, they come to you and say, yo, man, this last release ain't, you know what I'm saying? We've seen a lot more issues. You say, you know what, I'm going to take it serious. Let's sit together and prioritize these. So y'all sit together and you go to your sprint planning meeting and say, hey, we're taking on way too many features. John over in support, bro, he showed me the tickets. It's killing us right now. Sales is like we're losing customers. I would like to propose we slow down a little bit on the features and bring in some more bug fixes and reliability into the pipeline so you execute. So think about when the performance review process come around and you know how sometimes you have to go get references from other people that you've worked with. Now you can bring in John and John be like, man, Kelsey is the first engineer that took the time to come to support, figure out what we did need it to happen. We have less customer churn than we've ever had before in the past. So now your impact is up and you got the whole support org voucher for you. The sales team be like, man, Kelsey, I heard what you was doing for support. We've been getting a lot of good feedback from our customers. So now they rocking with you. And here's the thing. When you start to build that type of name brand recognition with yourself, your attitude, your work ethic, your actual results, three companies later, the same sales rep is there. It's like, oh, Kelsey, man, I used to work with him. We, we, we go hire him, right? Nah, he asked him for 150. Hell, pay him 175. He's the best engineer I've ever worked with. What are you trying to save 25,000? Hire him immediately. This is what happens behind the scenes. And I've personally benefited from situations like this where when you're not in the room, what are people saying about you? And that stuff is the difference between getting what HR offer or getting what you ask for. Mm -hmm. that, that's powerful. So um, I, I see that you've had like a bunch of different roles um, in you know, being a developer advocate, being a software engineer, I know your earlier roles. For someone aspiring to be in a situation like that, you know, looking back at your journey, what would be your advice to them in terms of like planning their career? I know like yours wasn't necessarily planned out, but just looking back, you know, what would be the strategy or some of the key points that you could give them? I mean, I think most successful people have something very, have something in common. They solve problems. So the bigger your tool bag is, the more problems you can solve. So if you only know one programming language, then you're probably going to do fine with any company that uses that programming language. You'll probably be able to do a collection of tasks that involve that programming language. And so in those scenarios, um, that's just kind of where your career will go. So to me, if you were not just a developer, so your HR title says you're a software developer or something more specific, you're a Python software developer. Right. So then you walk around like I am senior Python software developer and you buy all the Python books and you go to all the Python conferences and you just keep getting better at Python. Great. And maybe your career will do fine. But for someone like me, I'm like, hey, what happens before the Jira ticket gets assigned to me? Oh, well, we have a whole process of product review, UX, talking to customers, looking at strategies on what to build. It's like, hey, what skill set is that? Hey, what tool is QA using? Oh, no, they use this other tool for running um, integration tests. Well, let me learn how to do that. Who's building my software? Let me go learn all of those things. So to me, I just kept collecting skills. So of course, you handle the job that's in front of you, right? So when a company hires you to do job A, and a lot of people complain about not being promoted or their career isn't moving fast enough, because typically, if you do everything in the job requirement, you do everything that your manager asks, all you're doing is meeting expectations. What, what's, what's impressive about that? I asked you to do this and you did it. Like, that's why we pay you. The excitement comes from exceeding expectations. Wow, Kelsey, you're writing 30% of the test? Hmm, you improved the build times by 50%? Less developers are waiting on builds? So then you might decide that you wanna go into the build world. 
right? Maybe as an engineer, some customers are having a difficult problem and QA or the support team loves escalating to you because you take the time to provide great customer service and teach everybody involved, including the support team, how to solve such complex issues and then make sure that that issue gets resolved in the code base. So now you could easily go be the VP of technical support and bring your engineering lens to it. So look, you're a problem solver. And if your job title happens to be X, great, but don't forget to go learn Y. Mm -hmm. That's important. So um, I see that you're very uh, big on Kubernetes. You even uh, um, co-founded a Kubernetes-focused conference named KubeCon. Um, How did this kind of like relationship develop? uh, If you could share that very briefly. Yeah, I mean, I think with Kubernetes is still, that's more of a circumstantial thing, right? I worked at Puppet Labs for a couple of years, starting in like 2012. This is when DevOps is super hot. I learned Ruby at that time. So moving from Python to Ruby, and that's what you wrote when you were at Puppet Labs. So I, I think I understood configuration management deeply because before joining Puppet Labs, I was using it in production at that financial institution. And so I had these real world experience matched with being at a technology company And then Docker comes out around 2014. And when I looked at Docker, again, just literally just paying attention. I'm looking at Docker, say, instead of automating everything, what if you change the abstraction and you don't need to automate as much? And I'm looking at this as like, man, and I'm looking at the implementation of Docker is written in Golang. I'm like, why would they use Go instead of like Ruby or Python? That's what all the other tools are written in. Why do they make this departure? And then you says, let me learn a little bit of Go. So I'm reading the source code or I'm learning Go. And when I was at Puppet Labs, I was like, you know what? We having some performance bottlenecks for some of the Puppet tooling. What if we rewrote some of it in Go? And again, that's not my job. Nobody asked me to do that. But I'm paying attention to what's happening so I can take advantage of the opportunities. And I prototyped one of our systems in Golang. And I remember getting pushback because Go was too new. It was probably the right choice at the time. It didn't support Solaris or AIX. And Ruby did. And so I was like, you know what? My time has hit its limit at Puppet. It's time to go. I need to move into a world where I can be using Golang. I need to be in a world where I'm understanding what this container thing about because of all of my experience up until that point, we've been trying to solve the problem that Docker solves for a long time and writing configuration scripts ain't going to get it. And so when I switched to the next company, it was a company that was not a tech company in terms of building products and services but they use technology and production like any other company. And I went there and they had microservices written in Node.js. They had stuff written in Java, Python, just all over the place. And they were having some performance issues. I came in as an engineering leader, eventually the VP of engineering. And I remember they gave me an office. And I was like, no, I don't need no office. I like to sit with the dev team. And I'm managing teams across a couple of states. And I remember saying, guys, we should try Go for one of the services where, you know, if you're running in production and you have a slow runtime or inefficient runtime, you need 600 servers to serve the API when 10 could do. And so I was like, let's take that service and see if Golang can allow us to cut, you know, 600 machines from the fleet. That's real money for a smaller company. And so we started doing stuff in Go and we saw the performance boost. I think we even took it down to like six servers. Team was like, yo, this is good. And I said, listen, I'm not going to force this on nobody. It's a team. But if anybody want to learn Go, I think we should make this one of the more official languages that we do. And at that time, um, I was like, why are we using configuration management or any of these homegrown scripts when all we need is a container and a little bit of config? So I wrote this tool called CompD and open sourced it. So we were using it in production, open sourced it. And so I was like, you know what? This, is, this feels like the future. So then I'm speaking at the GopherCon you know, the Go conference, the first one. I'm also starting to look around. I'm like, what's this CoreOS thing? Because CompD was backed by etcd, which came from CoreOS. So now I'm kind of just dealing with the opportunities in front of me. I go give a keynote at uh, GopherCon and the CoreOS team is there. And eventually I'm working at CoreOS. And at CoreOS, we had our own tech stack. Kubernetes didn't exist yet. And Google announced Kubernetes. And I repeat the cycle. What's this Kubernetes thing? Why does it exist? How can I be helpful? Let me contribute. And that's it. And so uh, again, we're standing around and people are like, man, what if we had a conference for this? I was like, yeah, I'll be the MC. I'll chair it. I'll curate the content. 
we can make it happen. So that's it. It's not that I'm like, oh, Kubernetes is the best thing ever. It was just the opportunity was there. And if I'm going to do something, we go all in. And luckily by that time, I had so many more additional skills. I could talk and present. I could write code. I learned how to inspire people to see the future, even if they were stuck in the past. So all that stuff came together. And that's what y'all saw. So some people saw Kelsey on stage. Some people saw Kelsey on GitHub. Some people remember me from the Puppet Lab days. But the whole time, I'm just learning in public. It was just in full display. So you didn't have to look on LinkedIn for my resume. You saw me live it. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Again, we still have Kelsey here for about another 20 minutes. So if you have questions for him, please leave them in the comments, and I'll try to get him to answer as many of them as possible. Um, so it's funny like how all of this started with A plus and network plus um, and certifications is a hot topic right now. Do you think those are still relevant today? Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on certifications in general? The real question is, is learning relevant today? Mm. That's it. Do, do people realize there's damn near 9 billion people on earth? Are we all gonna watch the same YouTube video? Are we all gonna learn from the same blog post? What language are we talking about? English, French? What, you, you see what I mean? So given the diversity of people and preferred learning styles, and I think people forget circumstance. Some people are literally just gonna be walking through a bookstore. They're gonna see something that looks something related to computers. It's going to be the first book they grab. It wasn't like they sat around and looked for the best book. They just like the color red. So they touch the book that's red. They pull it down. They can afford the book because they just got a gift certificate. They buy the book. It's the only book that they can afford. So they read it three times and they turn out to be a Python developer. It's just circumstance sometimes. So to me, if, if you look at all the options, like you try Udacity, you try YouTube video, you try bootcamp, and then you try A plus and you like it, what are you going to do? You're going to say it worked for me. So when you're trying to help other people in your community, what you gonna tell them? Hey man, you might wanna check out this A plus thing. And if it works for them, great. This idea where you gotta, you know, forget certifications, forget that, it's kind of like, please stop folks. You know, and it could be different times. Like if you've been doing this since the eighties and you wanna learn a new technology, sometimes the fastest thing you can do is just go get a certification, right? Just say, you know what? I'm trying to learn this Amazon product I'm pretty sure Amazon team has put some thought into their training regimen. I'm not really trying to go to a nine month course. Let me just go get the study guide for the certification, learn the course skills. And I guess some people have never took certification training before. It's actually pretty good how people condense down this information to a point where you know most of the vocabulary. Sometimes you're even doing some hands-on things. There's just enough to get you started. And I think the most important component get you confident, man. Some people put the A plus certification on the wall. They wake up in the morning and they look at it and said, man, instead of watching Netflix all day, I took the time and I achieved something. So now I'm just going to achieve the next thing. So to me, learn how you learn. Nothing wrong with that. So yeah, I'm a big fan of all of the things, including certifications. So if someone was to start out, you know, brand new in tech today in 2024, because again, I think you touch on uh, a different problem then where there wasn't a ton, a ton of information out there. So it was probably a lot easier to find a specific thing. Now it's like today you go on Twitter, they're, they're talking about X, tomorrow they're talking about AI, next tomorrow they're talking about Python. What is that like, you know, settle down advice that you would give someone who's kind of like drowning in this sea of information? Yeah, like if you, if you want to teach someone how to cook, right? Usually they want to learn how to cook what? the food they like. Mm. You know, you, a kid be like, man, I love grilled cheese. All that butter, cheese, and bread, I love it. So when you teach a kid how to cook, you just teach them how to cook a grilled cheese because they understand the outcome, right? Man, if I do this right, and they know what it's supposed to taste like, so the North Star is clear. So you teach them how to make a grilled cheese sandwich. So now, are they a Michelin star chef? No. Do they know how to make grilled cheese? Cool. And so the next step may be spaghetti, right? Border noodles, right? So I think when it comes to like learning, I think it help, it's just helpful to pick something. I wanna be a software developer, I think. Okay, 
what do you like in the world that exists today? You like playing video games? Maybe you start with something where a video game is the learning path, right? Maybe you're playing Roblox. There's a programming language there. Maybe you like Minecraft, right? Like, so to me, I always ask people, maybe start where your interests are. Look, bonus points if you have a real problem. I think some of the most successful outcomes we've heard in the space where someone was trying to do something, but they had to learn how to code to do it. And so they had the goal that guided them. So the way I would tell people is pick anything. You want to be a developer? Put all the programming languages in a little bucket, shake it up, and pull the first one out. And whatever it is, if it's Java, just run with it. Go get a book on Java, learn Java, and then if you don't like it or you're not able to produce the stuff you want, then you can just pick another language. And everything you learn from Java will probably, some of it will carry over. So that's it. So most people paralyze themselves on the getting started point versus making more progress once they start it. So we do have a first question from Trey and he's asking, you know, you're a great communicator. How can he learn that? I mean, you already know how to talk. Most of y'all are communicating out of discomfort, right? You're scared of your boss. You might get fired. So you type the email being all timid. You're saying stuff that you think they want to hear versus what you want to say. So it just throws you off. But when you're around your friends, you communicate effectively to the target audience, right? Maybe you drop back into your slang. Maybe you say it with a little bit more swag. Maybe you say it in a way that gets that emotion going because you're looking at all the cues. Where am I at? Who am I talking to? And how do I want them to feel right now, right? And that's all part of communication. But then when we get into professional settings, we just like, man, I need to communicate like the most robotic person here. I need to communicate like the CEO trying to dodge legal repercussions for what they say. And so when you think about this communication thing, you, you already do it. When you watch a movie and you like what they just said or you hear a song and you like the way the verse went, go break down the communication style and the pattern for that particular target audience. And so when you're talking to someone, look at them. Do they understand what you're saying? Sometimes you're saying something because you want to elicit emotion. For example, some people argue with their spouse or their children. And think about sometimes in those arguments what you're actually doing. Sometimes all you want to do is hurt someone. So you say something mean. You're not trying to make progress. You're not trying to, you know, somebody may say, hey, how come you didn't wash the dishes? Now, the goal is to get the dishes washed, right? Very straightforward. The dishes are out. Company is driving on the way. We need to get the dishes washed. So if you were just to pause for a moment and clear your mind, you think about it. I could just do these dishes. So one way you could do it is say, paying attention to the whole situation. My wife is probably tired because she was doing stuff already. I think she's cleaning the bathroom. She can't clean the bathroom and the kitchen and the guest's gonna be in here in about 30 minutes. So you slowing down, you processing. You know what, babe? I got you, my bad. And just wash the dishes with a smile on your face because that smile communicates that you understand your role in helping everything. So that's communication. Now you could pop off and have the attention is like, you don't never wash dishes, so why are you asking me? Your intention was to hurt, not make progress on the dishes getting washed. So when you're communicating, what's your intention? So today, my intention was to inspire you all and demystify all the nonsense people be saying. Most of the stuff that has happened to people like me is straight up luck. So much so that I can't just give you this blueprint and you follow it step by step and it's just going to magically work for you. That doesn't work. But the only thing I can tell you, though, is that it's possible. And I can try to give you that nuance about how things typically work for me, what I've learned along the way. And then you can take bits and pieces of it. And if I communicate clearly, then the vision will be clear that you can actually say, damn, I took some notes and I've been doing some of the stuff you're talking about, but I was missing the step that Kelsey gave me the step today, so I'm gonna take it with me. So I know what my intention is. I didn't come on this podcast just to say a bunch of words. I came on this podcast hoping to give you what I wish I would have had 10 years ago. So that's what mm -hmm. I mean by this effective communication. Talk with a purpose. So we, <clears throat> we have another question that's asking, can you please explain, explain what uh, Kubernetes is? So this is, so this is the thing about Kubernetes. 
there are things in the world that you don't care about. So if someone explains it to you, you probably still won't care. That's the key to, I think, a lot of key explanations. So if I had to explain to you what a pot was, right? I would say, listen, when you're cooking food, you probably got to contain it into something because you try to put food on just straight fire, you're going to burn the food because you can't control the heat. Just raw flames touching food ain't going to work. So we have a piece of surface in between. Some pots are flat. Some pots have walls. Some pots are saucepans. There's lots of infrastructure between fire and food or some heating element. And we call it a pot. The whole point of the pot is to protect the food and allow you to control. So if you make an omelet, you probably want a pot that's a little more wide so you can flip the omelet. If you're making a sauce, you probably want the pot to be a little bit more narrow so that the things can stack and the water can boil. But that's what the pot does, right? Its job is to sit as infrastructure between food and fire so you can control the cooking progress process. So if you be cooking, you probably want a pot. It's interesting, isn't it? And there's all kinds of technologies. We can get deeper to how pots are made, how they're constructed, cast iron, whatever. So now let's get to Kubernetes. Here's the thing. Kubernetes is designed to solve a set of problems that you may not have. So it may or may not be interesting to you. So if you think about a world where you got a little small business and all you need is a website, go to Squarespace or Wix, pay $9 a month, get a little template, put your logo, you done, just like the commercial. You good, you don't need Kubernetes. But imagine if you're doing something a little bit more complicated. You're an actual insurance company where you have mobile apps, you have websites, you have a policy engine that quotes people prices based on their car, their age, all other factors, including geographic information that you've learned from your other customers and accident reports. All that data got to live somewhere. Now we beyond what Squarespace can do. So one technique that we all used to do and still do because ain't nothing wrong with it, you can go buy like a hundred servers, put them somewhere, and then you can set them up all one by one. Right, one by one, you set up every server. And then look, if you're good, you might know exactly what commands to run. And I'm assuming that you know something about technology or maybe Linux system administration. And so you take all 100 servers and you log in one by one, you tell someone, look, I'll get all these done in about 20 days, right? Because I got to log into each of them and repeat the steps over and over again. And then you get a little fancy. They say, hey man, we need to run the front end, the back end, the database, all these other things. So what are you going to do? you're going to probably create a little spreadsheet and you're going to say these 20 servers are for the website. And you're probably going to get the MAC address for the server too, right? You're going to say this serial number is this machine. You might even give it a little cute name like Transformers, right? Or Marvel characters. This one, Black Panther. This one's Thor. This one is Hulk, right? So you just name all the servers so you can identify them. So the Avengers run the front end. So then all the servers that are part of the Avengers, you give them Avengers names, Captain America, whatever. And then they run the front end. So now you got to, in the spreadsheet, you just see, you know, name of the server, what it's running, maybe things like the CPU and memory, just to make sure it can actually run the front end. So you do this for all 100. So at this, this moment, you scheduling where things need to go, right? So someone said, hey, we need 10 more front end servers. You add more to the front end pool on the spreadsheet and you use your scripts and you install stuff. So imagine then you got to put a load balancer on top. You can imagine where I'm going with this. All these activities that we've been doing for 20 years, the things that system administrators do, load balancers, scale out, scale down, uh, the app crash, you log in, you restart it. What if I took all of that stuff and put it into one system, just one software? So instead of you taking 100 servers and putting them in a spreadsheet, using Puppet Chef or Ansible to configure them, putting them behind load balancers and all of this stuff, what if I told you that we've been doing that for so long that we can just make one piece of software and we'll give it a name, we'll call it Kubernetes. So what you do now is you say, hey, Kubernetes, here's all 100 servers. Kubernetes is like, I got you. Just install the Kubernetes agent on all of them. And now the agent is like, yo, I found the memory, I found the CPU, I know what we got, we good. Now when you wanna run apps, you don't need the spreadsheet anymore. Kubernetes is essentially now holding its own spreadsheet, we call them nodes. So each of those nodes registers themselves like one slide in the spreadsheet. The difference now is when someone says, I need a web front end, instead of you just picking 20 servers and the other one's just running idle, Kubernetes is like, yo, just give me the web front end code 
in, an, in a container image so we can easily move it around. And Kubernetes said, I will pick the best one. The best one is working. The best one has the right of memory and CPU, and it makes that decision. So I know I'm simplifying here, but the thing is, throughout technology, especially every decade, once we do something long enough, we tend to make a new thing that just does that. And then some people will start their career as a system administrator, and they may only know Kubernetes. They don't know Terraform, Puppet, Linux system administration, because like, why would I do all that from scratch if the use case fits? Maybe I just start with Kubernetes if I'm gonna have to do those things anyway. So that's the way to think about any technology, but that's like a lot of high level explanation of what Kubernetes is. <clears throat> that's really that's really great. <clears throat> Next question we got is from Afro. It says, what are you looking forward to the most for your uh, render ATL keynote and what are the steps you take to prepare for it? How long does it take to prepare? I mean, that, that render ATL keynote gonna take, it took 43 years to prepare. That's how old I am. And when I think about keynotes, if you've seen me give a keynote in the last five or six years, there's no scripts, there's no slides. You're, you're at a moment now where you're like, there is something I want y'all to feel on that stage. I want you to feel that tech is more than just learning how to code and getting a job. Most of us are just working so we don't have to know more at some point or work on the things that we prefer. And so when I'm preparing for that keynote, when I turn the computer off and I'm washing the dishes, while I'm walking around the house, I'm thinking about that keynote. I'm thinking about all the relevant stories that make who, me who I am. I'm from Atlanta. This is a homecoming for me. My family gonna be in that audience. The peers that I care about in this, in this ecosystem, you know how many people, they're like, Kelsey, I'm, I'm thinking about quitting my job so I can get another one. Can I just call you before I make this decision that's gonna impact my life and my family? I know these people personally. So it's bigger than the stuff that we type on the keyboard. This stuff is, it's been my life. I retired off of this. And so when I'm thinking about that keynote, I'm not trying to show you the coolest thing you can do with Kubernetes, because that's not important. It's not that significant. What's significant is that there's, we are a whole people who have used this skill set sometimes just to simply get a job. But I think from some people forget, some of this technology literally liberates people. Some of this technology is key to some big things in the world. And so my goal for Render ATL is to remind you that we're not here just, oh my God, please give me a job so I can pay my bills. That's not the end of it. That's just where you start. And so if you keep the prize in mind, I want us all to elevate to a different level in this game. So it's, no, it's not, not nothing wrong with where you start, but I don't want us to get complacent and ignore the potential that's in front of us. So that's what the keynote will be. It's going to be an hour long keynote. So hopefully it feels like a stage play. It feels part comedy show. It feels technical expertise. He's not just saying it, he's showing it. He's showing what progress looks like. These are real stories. We're not making stuff up with real, you know, random anecdotes. So my goal is to be like, this is the best talk I've ever given. And I want it to feel that way when people walk away from it and say, yo, whew, I feel different about myself. That's how I want that keynote to land. So I'm gonna prepare for that one until June in my mind. Eventually I'll probably structure a few key points and I'll visualize in my head how I want it to feel on stage, how I want to feel. And when I look at the audience, how I want you to feel. And if I do it right, it's going to feel great when we on that stage. I'm, I'm already looking forward to it. I, I got one last question and then we'll take the last audience question. So um, you talk about retirement. <clears throat> I know that was a hot topic on, on Twitter last week. Um, what what is your and and I I want to kind of like set this up nicely because one of the things for instance one of the reasons why I care so much about tech and this platform I'm building to inspire people I think you've touched on it is I see the potential to change lives to earn a, a decent income to support your family things like that and I think that kind of like ties into that retirement conversation because ultimately as one of my really good friends will say. Um, the goal of money is, is to be able to be free, right? To be able to have that freedom to do what you want to do instead of what other people want you to do. And I think, or at least I'm assuming that you kind of like reached that point. And that's why you took that step back. What was that journey like for you? Oh, is my assumption even correct? There's surface level observations we all make and they're taught to us. You get a job, stay out of trouble. You'll make just enough money to work forever. 
that's the, that's the base case. And depending on where you live, they might have some type of program to make sure that when your body starts to fail, that society will take care of you, especially if your family can't. That's the surface. This is the surface trajectory for most people. If we're really being honest, most people ain't going to even get that. Most people are bound to poverty because of some stupid ass government decision, some dumb ass borderline that was drawn a hundred years ago and they got to suffer the consequences. This is just real facts. And so we lucky to live in this world where our line of sight and we got to be careful not to get tunnel vision is that we can see tech within grasp because we've seen people who look like us do it. The books are there. The training courses are there. All we got to do is reach for it and we're going to grab it. And the thing is we're going to grab it and a lot of us hold on to it and we ignore the rest of the world. It all fades away, right? We start to convince ourselves that this is really important and it might be important. I hate quoting this rapper and I won't say his name because he'd be doing other dumb shit that I don't want to co-sign. But he had this line in the song. He said, uh, they make us love their wealth and hate yourself. And so some people be like, money is everything. It's everything to know. I got to get the car, not because it's the best car, because you think it's the best car. So when I pull up in it, you look at it and you look at me as a better person, all because I pulled up in a car you can't afford. And so we just give status to people who never earned it. Do they do anything for you in your personal life? No. Would they do anything for you in your personal life? No. But we still admire them all because they have things we can't afford. And a lot of us have been taught to just desire things we can't afford. And here's the thing, and this is where I think it creates animosity because I'm gonna be honest, it's hard not to be jealous for people at people who have things you don't have, right? You're working, you're trading all this life for money to attain these things. So it's hard to look at someone else who has it and be honest that you're actually happy for them versus sad for yourself because you ain't got it yet. And the truth is, and look, I've been very fortunate. I don't make no bones about it. And you shouldn't be mad at me for being fortunate because I hope everybody gets there. And here's the truth. When you get all of that stuff, you realize that it's not that important. People can't believe me because like Kelsey, it's easy to say when you already got it. But if I already got it, then maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe. I'm not saying that you shouldn't deserve it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to aspire to it. I'm just saying that your whole life wasn't meant for it. And so when we get to that component, all this other stuff is just extra. You go buy the fancy car and crash tomorrow, then what? Was it worth it? Was all the steps you was putting in, was it worth it? And so when you dial all this stuff back, you gotta ask yourself at some point, what's the actual motivation for this? And here's the thing is, when I say retire and you thinking deeply, you can't retire unless everyone else isn't. Who's gonna keep the water running? Who keep the groceries flowing to the store? Who keep this platform running so we can have this conversation? So honestly, at this point, everybody's still playing a role. And I just get the benefit from the fact that money still has value and people choose to work for it. So I walk around humble in that. So when I say I'm retired, in many ways, I probably need to find a better word. I just have temporarily. I have more say over my time because I've accumulated this thing that people consider still valuable. So great. So I'm going to honor that. So when I honor retirement, I'm not just trying to watch Netflix all day. To honor retirement, I'm asking myself, when somebody shoot me an email that I don't know, and they say, Kelsey, I'm out here trying to help other people get to the stage where they need to be in life. Could you just come on my live stream and participate in that? And I say, no problem. Here's a link. Just click it, and I'm going to be there. What do I get from this? I don't need anything from this. That's the beauty of this whole thing. So to me, what better way to get to a point in life where you don't need anything from these things? I don't need anything from a job. I don't need anything from you. And since I don't need anything from you, it's so easy just to be helpful. I don't need anything in return. It's hard to be helpful when you need something in return. Hey man, can you help me move today? Like, dude, I need to go to work. So coming to help you is gonna cost me money and I need that money to pay my bills. So it's hard for me to really do what I would prefer to do. So when I think Mm -hmm. about this whole why we work, what we're progressing towards, I'm thinking about all of these things and I'm trying to ask myself what's really important. For me, it it can't be this stuff because that stuff keeps us depressed. Like even some of y'all right now is winning. Some of y'all work some entry level job. 
You getting paid more than 99% rest of the world. No, you are not a billionaire, but you have more money than 99% of the rest of the world. But the problem is you can't even enjoy it, right? You can't enjoy it because maybe you haven't slept on a park bench in a while. Maybe you forgot what it's like to not have hot water running. So instead of you enjoying what you have, because when you enjoy what you have and you come from your entry level job home, your kids see you smile, your spouse see you smiling, your mom see you smiling, everything looking good because you're able to enjoy that stage. And I'm not telling you to get complacent. I'm saying if you can enjoy that stage, well, when you get to the next stage, you're going to learn to enjoy that too. So that's all I'm telling people to do. So when I talk about retirement, I'm just talking about striving towards this world where you can feel like you're free from the rat race and start running your own. And, and I, of course, like you own that story, I don't even want to uh, say anything extra to it. But if I could add something, I, I see one of, one of the patterns that I see that I've spoken to older people is like, there's almost like this, you work your whole entire life, you go to school, you work, then when you're 65, you stop. That's so depressing for so many people, right? It's like you almost have to find purpose all over again. And I think something that you have to deal with this weirdness a little early on, and you've kind of like situated yourself to where when you get there, it's not even a problem because you found other things, you found other areas to build up that impact. You know, you talk about coming here, you're going to Reddit, you're doing all this amazing work now that you're free to do, not because you have to do, but because you enjoy doing and it, it's delivering impact. Yes, it's one of these things where if you just ask yourself, if you wake up in the morning, what I want to do with my time? And since most of us don't have a good answer because we never really were putting work in it, it, let's just be honest, most people do not put work into thinking about what they're going to do with their time. But the way employment works is they know what to do with your time. Right? They, they, they got a whole roadmap for you. Hey, this is what you're going to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. This is what you're going to do when you're on call. Right? This is what you're going to do. So they know what they got a plan for you. Why don't you have a plan for yourself too? So it's not that work is all bad because I've had some phenomenal jobs where it felt like the stars aligned. The things I was most passionate about, the things I was most interested in, they aligned so well where going to work felt good. I said, man, I can't wait, wait to wake up to work on this problem. But at the same time, I used to ask myself, then why can't I figure out problems that I want to solve that's not work related? What's my relationship with my family? What's my relationship with my friends? Why do I care about other things that's going on in the world? Because the thing is, that stuff takes the same amount of work as your job do. And a lot of us are just too tired to give any of that stuff detail or attention. And so I'm just hoping for everybody that if you can find, and I'm not talking just work-life balance. There is time in my career where I was working all 24 hours. I was just putting it all in. It's, it's seasonal. But when you get to that season where maybe you just had a kid, and you want to dial it back a little bit so you can spend time with your child, then you try to figure out a job or situation that maybe eight hours is all I want. I don't want to get promoted right now. I just want to put in my work, earn my money, so I can actually focus on the things I care about the most. That's the thing that you can do even before you get retired. That's within your control sometimes. And if that's available to you, isn't that wrong with taking advantage of that? Yeah. So last question we got is from Success, Success Stream uh, Whisper. Says, as a new guy in tech struggling to land a job without experience, how would you advise me to get a job? Man, I mean, first of all, we're not going to give up. So that's step one, right? You got your whole life to figure this out. So there ain't no time to run on this. Now, I'm just going to try to, I can just speak from my experience. Like if I was in this situation, and I'm sitting around like, man, I want a job in tech. That's my goal. But if I need money right now, I'm going to go to the Walmart. I'm, I'm going to Walmart. I might go to Best Buy and work in the Geek Squad. Maybe it's something tech related. But I'm going to go get something. And I know that when I get this job, I'm not going to retire there. It's just the first step. And so when I get this job, what's my plan? My plan is like, okay. I'm going to go work at Home Depot because it's not going to be too stressful, right? I'm going to go in. I'm going to do what I got to do. But when I leave, they're not, there's no on call for Home Depot. So great. So we're going to lock it in. You know what? I'm going to take the nighttime shift because that's 
you know, my learning opportunities are more in the daytime. I'm gonna figure out something that's gonna let me invest in myself. So, so first thing I'm gonna do, I'm not saying you gotta do it, but for me, if I need that income, I'm not gonna be too proud to just go get a job because there's a lot of work related skills you just learn by having a job, period. So like, for example, if you at Home Depot, so let's say you go to Home Depot, boom. All right, now I got a job, money coming in, got my health insurance, I'm, I'm where I need to be. So now what's my story? I work at Home Depot, that's what's on my resume. I did this boot camp coding school, that's also my resume. So now I'm applying for the job and the hiring manager's like, yo, why are you at Home Depot? It's like, because my ego isn't bigger than where I need to be. So I'm at Home Depot out of necessity. But here's what I'm doing. When I get off of Home Depot, what I'm doing is I'm replicating the Home Depot website on my own server. So Home Depot sells stuff online. I work there. I know how we stack the wood. I know how we price the wood. So I just started replicating the wood section of the website. So I got Postgres. My website is ugly because I don't really got a lot of design skills, but I got an API. And I know when I scan the wood, there's a barcode on it. It comes from the manufacturer that way. I bought a barcode from Amazon and I got some of the barcodes myself and I hooked up the barcode to my computer and I scanned it and on the terminal, the barcode is essentially a keyboard. And so when you scan it, what's the information? And then I learned how to take that barcode scan and put it in a database. And I got it all on GitHub. So I just did an open source thing. I know it's nothing special, but when you scan, it just goes straight into the database, very similar to the tool I use at work. So I'm the hiring manager. I'm like, yo, this is the type of person I need on the squad. You starting somewhere and you just find a problem space. So you, you look at the thing that you do and you look at like, how do I automate it? And if you really, really, really paying attention, Home Depot got a big office in, in Austin with a big data center where they run a lot of this stuff. They got a big office in Atlanta doing tech stuff. If you really paying attention, they got a program when you work at Home Depot in the store that Home Depot will pay you to learn tech so they can hire you on a tech side. So that's my plan A, we go on to Home Depot. I'm gonna to try to rebuild the stuff we use in the store. I'm gonna learn everything about e-commerce. I'm gonna to listen to the earnings call. I'm gonna look on YouTube for anyone that work at Home Depot that has spoken at a tech conference, right? Cause y'all work at the same place. Y'all got the same email address. Kelsey at homedepot.com and Jill at homedepot.com. I watched a video on YouTube and said, hey, Jill, you know, I'm not in tech yet. I work in the store, but I saw your video on YouTube and I'm trying to get into tech. And Jill going to be like, yo, we got a program where we transition people from the store to the thing. Let me get you the link. But you understand what I'm saying? Like you start somewhere and then you talk to people. So if you were to talk to someone like me, I'm like, man, go to Home Depot. Look, maybe you don't need to go to Home Depot. Maybe you don't need money that bad and you could just wait it out and you could take another path. But when I'm sitting down, this is the way I'm thinking about it. I'm like, yo, start at Home Depot, boom, boom, boom. And then I like to learn in public. I like to tell people what I'm doing. Some people will be like, oh, you work at Home Depot, man. You're doing this backwards, blah, 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 blah. So you're not trying to help me. So I got to put you over here. You actually might be right, but that's not what I need right now. So I'm going to have to put you over here. You go to the meetup and say, hey, I work at Home Depot. Um, I'm going to show you a little project that I'm working on at the house. Let me get the little demo out. You setting it all up. You showing people what you're doing. And everybody's sitting there like, yo, just do work at Home Depot, transition to tech. People like me want to be part of your story. So I see that. I say, hey, man, that's pretty dope what you're doing, bro. Like, what you writing in? I mean, I don't even know Python for now because that's the book I got. So I just, I just did it in Python. I said, man, I like your attitude. I'm going to keep you in mind. So when we hire somebody junior, I mean, it's a dude that used to work at Home Depot that's at the meetup. I like his passion. So we remember that. So that's just my formula. And we can paint any other scenario in the world. The same could be said for McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Walmart. All of them have tech arms. Or Best Buy Geek Squad, start there. So that'd be my advice to you, man, is that don't give up and do not limit yourself. Don't be like, oh, I got to get a job at Google or so I'm a failure. What are you talking about? This is a long trajectory Start where you're going to start, and then we're going to game plan from there, and you're going to end up where you need to be. I can almost promise you that will happen.
Wow, <clears throat> that's a really powerful answer, uh, Kelsey. Again, usually when we come to the end of this uh, streams, uh, I don't know if there's any last words, thoughts, advice that you wanna give. This is usually for that moment. I'm gonna answer one more question if we got time, because I see somebody put their questions. I'm gonna try to answer as okay. many questions as I can. I think it's uh, Zindar. And it says, any advice to avoid slowly oh, burning out? I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Oh, no worries. Uh, any advice that's slowly burning out if the tech stack at your job doesn't interest you? So this is very common, right? So let's say you get a job and they doing some PHP. Ain't nobody on Twitter talking about no PHP. You go to the meetup, ain't nobody got no PHP t-shirt on. So you're like, man, I don't even want to tell nobody what we doing at my job. I'm, I'm almost feeling a little embarrassed. So it's hard for me to get excited. And so that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is like, okay, I'm at this place that pays me real money, that lets me buy real things. That dollar you make from PHP, spend just like the dollar you make from writing in Rust. Same dollar now. The truth is there are some people writing PHP that make way more money than the cool kids, right? Uh, people forget there's a lot of popular websites like Facebook that's still written in PHP. Right, so you gotta make sure you really understand like why these things exist, who's still using it. And remember, you're not, you don't need to work everywhere. You just need to work at a place, but say, all right, so now I'm at the job and they got PHP in the stack. So instead of me getting all down about what I don't have, what do I have? So how does PHP work? So PHP, you know, there's some bytecode that runs on some runtime. So how does the runtime interface with the Linux kernel? How does it make syscalls? All programming language makes syscalls. So at this point, how does PHP work all the way down the stack? When I put something on the network and respond to an HTTP request, what's really happening? You can learn about Chrome. You can learn about how isolation works. You can learn about networking, kernels. You can learn about everything. The only thing different is what programming language is interacting with the world. That's it. So you can learn the technologies around it. And what you'll realize is that most of this stuff is interrelated in some way. Right? Are you excited because it's Go and not PHP? What are you talking about? Go is interacting with the world in a very similar way as PHP. So there's some interest somewhere. So if I was you and you had a company where you think the tech stock ain't interesting because you ain't looking, you're not looking deep down the stack. You're not linking up the stack where the customers are, right? There's a way for you to make it better. So if, if look, sometimes I don't want interesting. I want it to just work, bro. When we launch a deployment, nobody paid your go wall, no alerts. What? You talking about you want some excitement? I mean, you go to a place, as soon as they do a release, everything light and red, everybody paid your going off on call, logging in with their hair on fire. You want that? Nah, bro. I want stuff. Sometimes I want boring, right? So I would just say this, man. There is potential in any tech stack because the fundamentals are all the same. Just keep that in mind. And if you don't know that yet, this is what's going to make your job exciting. When you go back to your job, I want you to ask a new set of questions. It's on you to be asking interesting questions. How does PHP talk to the kernel? If you don't know the answer, it's about to get real interesting for you. And you're going to learn a lot of transferable skills. So that's just, they, it's not boring, bro. Trust me, ask the right questions. And if you don't know what questions to ask, Get with people and ask questions like you're asking now. You're doing the right thing. You're asking questions that's going to get you to a point where you can start asking those interesting questions on any uh, tech stack. What does it do, Sad? I see where you're coming from, but the public sector open shift is not just working. Again, this stuff don't matter, man. Public sector, private sector, Google, small insurance company. You just got a collection of people who are trying to solve problems. And yes, they all may run around with a different religion public sector, oh, it needs to be government approved and Fed ramp, blah, 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 blah. These are just problems, bro. Look, you want Fed ramp? You want to install OpenShift in a way that makes it not usable by anybody? As long as my check come on Friday, we'll do it. And while we're doing it, I'll look for a job that doesn't have that. Right? That's it to me. It's like, it's just, just put the puzzle together. Don't over-index on public sector. You don't own these things, right? You're just different companies, same team. Swap up when necessary. Look, in closing, I appreciate y'all for hanging out with us. Hopefully this advice was interesting. I just want y'all to remember that a lot of the stuff that we're showing y'all on social media, 
It's just the results. And most of us ain't even showing you the failures. All we doing is cherry picking the stuff that worked and painting this illusion that everything we do works. That's not what's actually happening. What's actually happening behind the scenes, a lot of us have self-doubt. I've been speaking keynotes for almost 10 years and I'm still nervous about how I'm going to perform next week at the Open Source Summit. All these things are same emotions no matter how long you're doing this stuff. So just appreciate where you are. Look at the opportunities in front of you and don't be afraid to surround yourself around people who are going to let you learn in public and support you on your journey. And so hopefully you got a little bit of that today and just don't give up, man. It eventually comes to you. That's amazing. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I think we've covered all the different questions now. This was really impactful. I learned a lot, especially when you're talking about, you know, how to still have that entrepreneurial mindset and still be able to succeed with it in tech, not really dimming your light, still being able to shine. I'm sure. Um, please give, uh, drop some hearts, drop some likes, drop some uh um, some thumbs up. I, I think this has been really powerful for, for, for everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, that's our stream for tonight. I uh, will catch you again next week with another episode of the uh, Working in Tech live stream.